Sermon 6, the conclusion of the Black Book entry from February 5th, 1916. But when Philemon saw that the dead remained silent and waited, he continued, and this is the sixth sermon to the dead. The diamond of sexuality approaches our soul as a serpent. She is half-human soul and is called thought-desire. The diamond of spirituality descends into our soul as the white bird. He is half-human soul and is called desired thought. Sermon 6 begins with a word that has shown up throughout the series, diamond. The root of this word means to divide, and we see this picked up by Jung as he says each is half-human soul. And with this one will begin to notice that this sermon begins to hit closer to home. We all have thoughts and desires, especially those that arise unwillingly, which directly affect each of us. At this point, what's important to highlight is the binding between thought and desire, as Jung places thought desire on the serpent and desire thought on the white bird. While I don't want to remark on the reasoning for these placements, as we'll gain more on these two psychic essences by the end of the sermon, I do want to remark on the unity of thought and desire. As one ponders this unity of thoughts and desires, and realizes this pair carries an intelligence and movement with it, it becomes apparent that there's a sense of logos and eros rooted in these diamonds. For those that have read the Red Book or watched my series, you will pick up on Jung's emphasis that Logos and Eros are bound to each other. Jung calls Logos a form-giving principle that means understanding, insight, foresight, legislation, and wisdom. On the other hand, Jung presents Eros as a form-fulfilling principle described as desire, longing, force, exuberance, pleasure, and suffering. He then adds... These two are fundamental psychic powers that form a pair of opposites, each requiring the other. Now, before going into the symbols of the white bird and serpent, I do want to emphasize the importance of using such imagery and names to point to the invisible psychic forces Jung highlights throughout the sermons. If one remains bound to their opinions and beliefs about serpents and birds, or spirituality and sexuality, Without being open to exploring the invisible psychic essence that Jung's pointing to, then one remains completely lost in their ignorance. The only way to live this, to know thyself, and individuate to be free to truly see and hear, is to be wide open to what is. And there can never be a what is when what you think is is consciously or unconsciously influencing your perception. With that, we'll begin with the earthly serpent, the diamond of sexuality. As the god, sexuality, was given a masculine creative energy, its diamond is feminine and an embracing energy. Additionally, this diamond approaches one's soul, as it is a part of it, emphasizing its rather earthly movement. On the other side, the god of spirituality, the heavenly mother, provided an embracing energy, whereas its messenger, its diamond, the heavenly white bird, is masculine and creative. This diamond, instead of approaching one's soul like the serpent, descends into one's soul, picking up on its heavenly movement. We'll continue in the sermons as Jung speaks on the essence of the diamond of sexuality, the serpent. The serpent is an earthly soul, half daimonic, a spirit, and a client to the spirit of the dead. Thus, too, like these, she swarms around in the things of the earth, making us fear them or else having them arouse our cravings. The serpent has a female nature, forever seeking the company of those dead who are spellbound by the earth and who did not find a way across to singleness. The serpent is a whore. She courts the devil and evil spirits. She is a mischievous tyrant and gadfly, forever inveigling the most evil company. 
In so little, much is said. Yong presents this earthly diamond with rather choice words. But the most important of them all is the effect it creates in oneself. You'll notice Jung point directly to two eternal psychological traits which influence consciousness. As she swarms around in things of the earth, we hide in fear or run towards cravings by the bewitchment of the serpent. These eternal psychological traits she pokes at are fears and pleasures. This is why Jung uses rather dark and shady traits to this diamond of sexuality. And when fears run their course on an individual, without the individual reflecting on their fear to see the light and wisdom that lies behind the apparent ignorance and darkness, then one becomes attached to something, dependent on something, to relieve their fear. The individual seeks security in an identity, an ideology, a leader, a religion, or the like. On the other hand, while fears create attachments, it is pleasure which creates one's addictions. Instead of one sitting with the pull of the arousal of a craving to see what lies behind the apparent need for fulfillment, the masses are taken off day after day, night after night, to fulfill their empty tank. And to fulfill the tank, it leads one straight into the addictions in sex, drugs, food, fame, money, and the like. And as I gave an understanding on what lies behind the walls of security due to fear, which is the light of wisdom or truth, it is love behind this constant drive for fulfillment. But since it is a difficult trap to break, as there is much pain, disappointment, sacrifice, and suffering along the way to truth and love, the masses remain spellbound to the earth. And while Philemon or Jung is alluding to the dead which these sermons have been directed to, which are those souls who died without individuation and crossing over, one can see how this term, the dead, describes most alive today. It is no far-fetched to see how many in society have become completely spellbound by the earth. And the recent technology boom is only deepening this spell. And even if one is breaking free, individuating, there is always a creeping shadow waiting to be seen. And one final point to add on the serpent before moving to the white bird is the other half of the soul of the serpent. Jung labels it earthly and demonic. So to put it all together, this feminine energy embraces those who have not crossed over to singleness, anyone spellbound to the earth moving the souls it is a part of with fears and pleasures. While this sense of Logos and Eros may not be of their highest essence, we do see a lower earthly form creeping through in the serpent. As the serpent is closer to home, we'll now focus our attention to a distant white bird, the diamond of spirituality, who Jung now speaks on. The white bird is half celestial soul of man. He abides with the mother and descends from time to time. The bird is manlike and is effective thought. He is chaste and solitary, a messenger of the mother. He flies high above the earth. He commands singleness. He brings knowledge from the distant ones who have departed before and attained perfection. He bears her words up to the mother. She intercedes, she warns, but she is powerless against the gods. She is a vessel of the sun. A few points to go into on the symbol of the white bird. First, notice how Jung says he descends from time to time, providing effective thought. This seems to allude to those moments of insight that come unexpectedly through consciousness. Additionally, Jung says he provides knowledge from those who have departed and attained perfection. With this first point, one can see a connection with the white bird and the Christian idea of the Holy Spirit. Another point to add is the nature of the bird. 
He is chaste and solitary, commanding singleness. While the serpent is attracted to those dead and spellbound to the earth, the bird is attracted to those who are individuating and able to bear singleness. It is not to say that the bird will become a daily visitor for an individual individuating, but if one is chasing the serpent into endless dead ends, they'll never become aware of these necessary flashes of truth. I'll also add on this, one cannot command the bird to be present, perform some ritual to draw the bird in to extract some truth. These insights, the white bird, moves on its own terms. So always be open and ready to receive this distant, yet part of our soul. Speaking of this part, Jung says it is a half-celestial soul of individuals. Where the serpent provided a lower, earthly form of Logos and Eros, we see the white bird provides a higher, heavenly, truer essence of this eternal pair. Now to conclude this sermon, Jung brings back the serpent as it is more prevalent to a society hiding in fear and chasing unfulfilling pleasures. The serpent descends and cunningly lames the phallic diamond or else goads on him. She bears up the two crafty thoughts of the earthly, those thoughts that creep through every hole and cleave to all things with cravings. Although the serpent does not want to, she must be of use to us. She flees our grasp, thus showing us the way which our human wits could not find. Before expanding on that last sentence, as one would want nothing to do with the serpent at this point, we must explore the effects this has on the phallic diamond, the god of sexuality. This creative earthly essence is lamed or provoked, unable to be itself. The serpent has all the marks of evil from the sermon, and it does what is evil to sexuality. It distorts it. And we see this distortion through the crafty thoughts of the earthly, creeping through every hole and cleaving to all things with cravings. So how is she of use to us? How does she show one the way? Earlier I mentioned how when one is individuating, they still have blind spots, shadows that await their light. And it is those shadows that the serpent points one directly towards. This is the beautiful power of the serpent. It shows us, points us to the dark spots in our psyche, the deep fears and cravings, which one may never come to see in their own thinking. So as Jung says, she shows us the way through the addictions and attachments, fears and longings, through the dark, into the light. Now at this point, I think it's fair to add some thoughts on why Jung named the serpent thought desire and the white bird desire thought. The serpent, as we have seen, bears up crafty earthly thoughts which then stimulates desire. If it is fear, the desire stimulates a need for safety. If it is pleasure, the desire stimulates a need for fulfillment. On the other hand, the white bird is not desired, but rather one is in a desirable state for the bird to descend with insight. And that desirable state is rather meditative, chase and solitary able to bear singleness. And then we remember it is effective thought which Jung labels the bird, and we see how this movement ends in thought, whereas the previous ends in desire. Now there may be other reasons for this, as one may remark Salome and Elijah on the left and right of Jung throughout his Red Book visions, but this is all speculation. If you have any thoughts on your own, I'd love to see it in the comments. Now, to conclude on this pair of the serpent and white bird, I want to bring forth a line from the Bible that kept coming up, which seemed fitting to place at the end of the sermon. Behold, I send you forth as sheep in the midst of wolves. Be ye therefore wise as serpents and harmless as doves. 
with that, the Black Book entry, the same entry which began Sermon 4, has concluded. But as promised, a powerful post-sermon discussion transpires between the dead Philemon and Yonk. The discussion begins in the Red Book, as the dead looked on with contempt and said, Cease this talk of gods and diamonds and souls. We have known this for a long time. But Philemon smirked and replied, You poor souls, poor in flesh and rich in spirit. The meat was fat and the spirit thin. But how do you reach the eternal light? You mock my stupidity, which you too possess. You mock yourselves. Knowledge frees one from danger. But mockery is the other side of your belief. Is black less than white? You rejected faith and retained mockery. Are you thus saved from faith? No. You bound yourself to mockery and hence again to faith. And therefore, you are miserable. But the dead were outraged and cried, We are not miserable. We are clever. Our thinking and feeling is as pure as clear water. We praise our reason. We mock superstition. Do you believe that your old folly reaches us? A childish delusion has overcome you, old one. What good is it to us? I'm going to take a quick pause to add a few comments. First, notice the difference in tone between Philemon and the dead. While he is smirking and rather still in his response... The dead are crying, defensive, and reactive. They have a sense of pride that they are defending. That egoness that must die before self can ever truly be. And quickly, I do want to mention the connection between the dead who Philemon is speaking to and the living dead I spoke about earlier. One will notice the same whimpering tone of the earthly egos plaguing society today. This cry... And this pride is everywhere. What is rather hilarious is how the dead project just this truth about themselves onto Philemon, calling everything he teaches and says a childish delusion. Philemon helps us catch this psychological projection from the dead as he tells them that they mock themselves when they mock him. The second point to add is what Philemon is trying to get across to the dead. And it has to do with the idea of knowledge. You see Philemon remark that knowledge will free one from danger. But knowledge is also binding. Unless one is patient with the words Philemon speaks to the dead here. You'll miss that he connects knowledge to belief. And we remember that the entire purpose of the sermons is to bring the dead that are trapped in belief and opinion beyond it say beyond the veil, towards understanding and knowing. So as the dead remain trapped in their beliefs, their pride that their thinking and feeling is pure, and praising their reason, Philemon calls their bluff. He calls them miserable. And we see the outer manifestation of this inner misery in the tone towards Philemon throughout the post-sermon discussion. At this point, Philemon will be more direct about the notion of going beyond one's knowledge, one's belief, as he answers the dead's previous question about what good his teaching has for them. What can do you any good? I free you from what still holds you to the shadow of life. Take this wisdom with you. Add this folly to your cleverness, this reason to your unreason, and you will find yourselves. If you were men... You would then begin your life and your life's way between reason and unreason and live onward to the eternal light whose shadow you lived in advance. But since you are dead, this knowledge frees you from life and strips you of your greed for men. And it also frees yourself from the shrouds that the light and the shadow lay on you. Compassion with men will overcome you and from that stream you will reach solid ground. You will step forth from the eternal whirl onto the unmoving stone of rest. The circle that breaks flowing duration and the flame will die down. I have fanned the glowing fire. I have given the murderer a knife. 
I have torn open healed over wounds. I have quickened all movement. I have given the madman more intoxicating drink. I have made the cold colder, the heat hotter, falseness even falser, goodness even better, weakness even weaker. This knowledge is the axe of the sacrificer. To grasp this sort of riddle or spell, we must begin at the end. This knowledge in which Jung presents to the dead is not the same knowledge as the dead have been used to, the knowledge in which they just took pride in. It is another kind of knowledge. As Philemon says, this knowledge is the axe of the sacrificer. For those who remember the Red Book series, the entire experience for Jung took place due to the idea of sacrifice. It is individuation which requires this ultimate sacrifice. A sacrifice of one's ego's opinions and beliefs. The ego sacrificing its reality in order to grasp the truth is sacrificing itself as a whole in order for the divine child to be born. It is, as Jung says, the sacrificer and the sacrifice. And as Philemon provides the dead another knowledge, he is at the same time destroying their past knowledge. This is why I called it a sort of spell, as he's undoing the dead's bindings to the earth. He is using his logos to make the unthinkable thinkable, providing a whole new sense of logic and reason than we've come to know. And this logic and reason, a logic and reason without accumulated knowledge and thinking, is possibly the original idea of logic and reason that the ancient Greeks were writing about. And very few seem to catch this. One individual who's caught the spiritual nature of the Greeks is Peter Kingsley. In his book, Reality, he speaks about Socrates' message. And one can see how it relates to what Philemon has just done with the dead. Kingsley writes, The heart of Socrates' message, the unwavering purpose of his elenchos, was to show people that they know nothing. There was no hope of real knowledge without first accepting and understanding this. And what is rather interesting to note is how Socrates' practice of elenchos, which means uncovering the truth, was revealed to him by divine guidance, just as Jung's divine guidance is being received through Philemon. This real knowledge in which the process of elenchos will lead one is the knowledge Philemon is bringing forth to the dead. And the only direction this knowledge points with the weak weaker and the good better is wholeness. But before grasping the whole, one must be left in the dark so that the faintest of lights may be seen. When one is open to what is, without their belief, opinions, and especially the egoness in the way, then one finally begins to understand. But without this crucial step, one will never see past the earth towards the eternity which allows everything to be. And it's difficult for the dead or the living dead to grasp Philemon's teaching because it's paradoxical. As the sacrificer is the sacrifice, it's tough for an ego to realize that it's their very own opinions and beliefs, their accumulated knowledge that keeps them from experiencing reality. And in order to get through to break the thick egoness, we see how Philemon goes a bit Socrates on the dead throughout the sermons, and especially in this post-sermon discussion. Now, there's much more to say about this section, such as Jung or Philemon's claim that the dead's knowledge, the knowledge we all subjectively cling to, only holds one to the shadow of life. We must continue as the dead respond by crying to Philemon, Your wisdom is foolishness and a curse. You want to turn the wheel back? It will tear you apart, blinded one. Philemon replied, So this is what happened. The earth became green and fruitful again from the blood of the sacrifice. Flowers sprouted. The waves crashed into the sand. A silver cloud lies at the foot of the mountain. 
a bird of the soul came to men. The ho sounds in the field and the axe in the forests. A wind rushes the trees and the sun shimmers in the dew of the rising morning. The planets behold the birth. Out of the earth climb the many armed. Stones speak and the grass whispers. Man found himself and the God wanders through heaven. The fullness gives birth to the golden drop, the golden seed, plumbed and hovering. The last riddle concluded with Philemon stating that this new knowledge is the axe of the sacrificer. One could see where this is leading, as it is this sacrifice which leads to this imagery of the earth becoming green and fruitful again. We see here Philemon presenting a world to the dead where individuals took their self serious, started their own red book journey, and stepped aside to allow being to be. This rather esoteric teaching concludes with the idea of man or woman finding self. And you see all the signs pointing to the divine child, the Jungian self, with this image of the golden drop, the golden seed, plumbed and hovering. At this point, the dead's tone has changed as Philemon seems to get through to them in his own magical ways. The dead now fell silent and stared at Philemon and slowly crept away. But Philemon bent down and said, It is accomplished, but not fulfilled. Fruit of the earth, sprout, rise up, and heaven, pour out the water of life. Then Philemon disappeared. So we see before Philemon disappearing that he blesses the earth, a new earth for a new age, a new conscious awareness to come through. At this point, much has occurred between the dead and Philemon, but Jung himself has been missing. It isn't until the following night, which is only found in the Red Book and nowhere in the Black, where Jung speaks to Philemon about what just occurred the previous night. Jung writes, I was probably very confused when Philemon approached me the following night, since I called to him saying, What did you do, O Philemon? What fires have you kindled? What have you broken asunder? Does the wheel of creation stand still? Philemon answered, Everything is running its usual course. Nothing has happened. And yet a sweet and indescribable mystery has taken place. I stepped out of the whirling circle. Jung replies, What's that? Your words move my lips. Your voice sounds from my ears. My eyes see you from within me. Truly, you are a magician. You stepped out of the whirling circle? What confusion? Are you I? Am I you? Did I not feel as if the wheel of creation was standing still? And yet you say that you stepped out of the whirling circle? I am truly bound to the wheel. I feel the rushing swaying of it. And yet the wheel of creation also stands still for me. What did you do, Father? Teach me. Earlier in the series, I spoke about the unity between Philemon and Jung as we remember the Black Book version doesn't mention Philemon addressing the dead. It is Jung addressing the dead in the Black Book version and Philemon in the Red Book version. And here, it is as if it is the moment that Jung realizes the unity between himself and Philemon. And this realization surrounds an interesting idea that Philemon and Jung address, which is stepping out of the whirling circle. If time, the world of creation, is the whirling circle, then one can see how stepping out of it would be stepping into eternity. For those familiar with Buddhism, this seems to directly relate to the wheel of life or the wheel of becoming. So opposite of becoming would be being, which is the state where one must be to allow anything divine to be born. Jung concluded his last statement to Philemon asking him to teach what he did to him. So he provides this to Jung in one final riddle to ponder. I stepped onto what is solid and took it with me and saved it from the wave surge, 
From the cycle of births and from the revolving wheel of endless happening, it has been stilled. The dead have received the folly of the teaching. They have been blinded by truth and see by mistake. They have recognized, felt, and regretted it. They will come again and will humbly inquire, since what they rejected will be most valuable to them. To this, Jung himself concludes, I wanted to question Philemon since the riddle distressed me, but he had already touched the earth and disappeared, and the darkness of the night was silent and did not answer me, and my soul stood silently, shaking her head, and did not know what to say about the mystery that Philemon had indicated and not given away. So with this final riddle, we will have to wait until Sermon 7 to unravel it. In addition, we'll tie a bow on the entire series. Speaking of this final sermon, Sermon 7, the dead return as Philemon predicted with one final question. They want to know about humanity. What is the purpose of this whole existence of creation? So we've been through eternity and the Pleroma, to Abraxas in the world of creation, the gods and diamonds in between, and we finally have arrived at the closest point we all know, and that's ourselves. So we'll see how it all wraps up as Jung presents us with a final sermon on his psychological cosmology. This final teaching, another powerful post-sermon discussion, and a conclusion on the series is on the way. I appreciate all the support on this content. And until next time, stay humble.